One of the frontier feminists closest to my heart was the first female member of the Alaskan Tor Territorial House of Representatives, the wonderfully named Crystal Brilliant Snow Jen. Jen was the first Jen first came to Alaska when she was just three years old. In 1887, her family was part of a small troop of actors who wanted to bring some culture to the miners who dominated the territory. When her father caught the gold bug himself, Crystal and her family made a harrowing trip through the infamous Chilcote Pass and route to the Yukon Territory near the Alaskan border. They survived a surprise blizzard by digging in the snow cave and living there for three days before a rescue party found them. After spending some time outside, as Alaskans term the lower 48, Crystal returned to Juneau in 1914, and when the youngest of her three children was 13, became the first woman to run for the Territorial House of Representatives. She lost her first race, then her second, then her third, and her fourth. Finally, in 1940, she was successful, and at a time when she could have been with great justification, considered herself a, vic a victim of anti-female bias. Jen regarded herself as anything but, and at a time when she could have appealed the whole shared resentment of other women in order to win votes, Jen appealed to them as citizens, no more, no less. Here's how she described herself in the voters of southeastern Alaska in 1936. I firmly believe that what is needed in our legislator today is a real representative of the people whose qualifications are honesty, common sense, knowledge, contradiction of conditions, aggressiveness, independence, fearlessness, together with my business ability and experience, together with business ability and experience. On her first day as the lone woman in Alaska territorial legislator, Jen jotted down, Jen jotted, Jen jotted down, there we go, some notes to herself, which she entitled Idle Thoughts of a Woman Legislator by the Honorable Crystal Snow Jen, member 15th session of the territorial legislator. Yeah, did we mention this was the Territorial Legislator, in case you guys didn't know? Uh, she's talking about the Territorial Legislator. Just, just making sure you guys know. Dear, dear, I'm the odd one again. I vote no on spending the Territory's money for nothing. I'm invited, I am invited with apologies to remain away from the American Legion Dinner for Legislators. No offense, I'm sure. The stag oratory will have little to no bearing on my legislative manners, I can imagine, far be it from me to cramp the boy's style, I feel justly proud that these men shall know that I will neither weep nor faint as they notify me that my presence is unwelcome. Watch your step, Jen, fight your convictions, but don't be a windbag, it gets you nowhere. With honorable colleagues facts, with honorable colleagues facts win, and what? With honorable colleagues facts win? If she had a comma, that would make sense, but she doesn't, so I'm just going to kind of scratch my head and wonder what the hell she's talking about. And with the other kind, know your opponent and trump the trick. My hero in heroine, because you can't just call a hero because that sucks so slow. Judging by the emergence of mama grizzlies, it's becoming more acceptable to call yourself pro-career and pro-family, pro-motherhood and pro-life feminists. But judging by the reaction among liberal feminists, you should think that these emerging conservative feminists have stolen their copyright on the word. Feminist icon Gloria Steinem even declared that no woman who believes in abortion is wrong can call herself a feminist. The writer in the Washington Post hyperventilated the, that women of the emerging conservative feminist identity represented by the Mama Grizzlies don't support its women's rights. So, how can they paint their movement as pro-women? Why are they not laughed out of the room? The Liberal Daily Coast website Simply Harpoon? Republicans have some nerve. Some nerve indeed. Modern feminism has worked for decades equated being pro-abortion and with being pro-women. In the years following Roe vs. Wade, we were told that the issue was no longer open for debate and we should just get over it and move on. But Americans, including American women, haven't simply moved on and have ignored the issue of conscience. According to a 2009 Gallup poll, more Americans consider themselves pro-life than pro-choice today, including more women. The pro-abortion orthodoxy of liberal feminists have been shattered by the ultrasounds that now allow us to see a human life forming and the heart beating as early as six weeks into a pregnancy. Despite the court's 1973 ruling, American 
women and men haven't been able to get over the stirrings of their conscience or move from an issue that cues to the hearts of who we are as a people, affirming the dignity and worth of every human innocent life and defending the defenseless of fundamental American values. It occurred to me that we just kind of went on a whole tirade of abortion. Um, how did we get here, guys? Seriously? Because I'm lost. I I'm honestly lost. <sighs> Liberal feminism tells American women that they can't value life and call themselves women. There is no way out of here. It will be dark soon. There is no way out of here. It'll be dark soon. God, just because you word it differently doesn't mean you're being redundant. More and more women are rejecting the cynical message. I came across a remarkable piece on Washington's Oath on Faith blog by columnist Colleen Carroll Campbell that revealed the liberal feminist argument for what it is, a false choice. Campbell explained that the growing number of women today reject the false dichotomy of whatever of abortion-centric feminism says respect for human dignity is a zero-sum game in which some women can only win if her only unborn son child dies. Again with the run-on sentences! For many American women, the feminists that was once attracted to them with its lofty goal of promoting respect for women's dignity has morphed into something antithetical anti to that dignity. A movement that equates a woman's liberalization with their license to kill her unborn child, marginalizes people of faith that they can support even modest restrictions on abortion, and colludes with a sexist culture eager to convince a woman in crisis that dealing with her unplanned pregnancy is her choice and therefore her problem. Many women are not buying it. They are attracted instead to the message groups of Feminists for Life, which tells women facing unplanned pregnancies that they should refuse to choose between having a future and having a baby. You can still have a future with a baby, though! What whack job lives in this world where if you have an unplanned pregnancy, that automatically means game over. You lose. Your life is over. I mean, yeah, it's unfortunate, but it's it's not the end of the world. Oh my god, this... How long are we going to harp on this abortion issue? This is just getting annoying. They believe that the best way for a woman to defend her dignity is to defend the dignity of each and every human person, including the one that grows within her womb. This rising pro-life sentiment among women has begun to surface public opinion polls. A 2007 study from Overbrook Research tracked the abortion views of women in Missouri, considered to be bellwether state on such issues. Researcher, okay, you know what? This is all boring. This is all quote. Is any of this going to be important? Let's see. More articles. Terms of deeds, human rights. And pretty much talking about the true meaning of feminism. So pretty much nothing important. This, this whole book, the, these quotes, they're just a waste of the time. God, I'm, I'm starting to consider just skimming over them. This is getting ridiculous. Together, the pro-woman, pro-life sisterhood is telling the young women of America that they are still capable of handling an unintended pregnancy and still pursue a career in education. Strangely, many feminists seem to want to tell that these young women are that they're not capable, that you can't give your child life and still pursue your dreams. That's what I was saying. Women, you are not strong enough or smart enough to do both. You are not capable. I, I, I'm, I'm lost. Uh, maybe someone out there can explain how she's gotten to this point, but as for me, I'm, it's just kind of like... 
<sighs> the new feminism is telling people that they are capable and strong and that if keeping a child is impossible, adoption is a real beautiful choice. It's about empowering women to make real choices, not forcing them to accept false ones. It's about compassion and letting those scared young women know that there will be someone, some help there to raise their children in those less than ideal circumstances. I believe this so strongly because I've been there. I planned on being the mother of a son with special needs. I thought God would never give me anything I can't handle. When I found out that my baby would be born with Down Syndrome, I thought immediately, Hey God, remember when you promised you wouldn't give me something I couldn't handle? I don't think I can handle this. This wasn't part of my life's plan. I was scared. Oh, boo -hoo. I didn't know if my heart was ready. I didn't know if I was patient and mature, nurturing enough. You're not. Just, you know. From what I've seen, you're not. Just, just, just no. I'll answer that question for you right here. You know. <sighs> My sister Heather has a child with autism, and I always thought, see, God knows what he's doing. He gave Heather an autistic child because she's more nurturing, the more nurturing one. She can handle it. When Trig was born, I understood that God did know what he was doing. Now, it first seemed like an overwhelming challenge has turned into our greatest blessing. All the time, it seems God has been stirring my ears, saying, are you going to trust me? Are you going to walk the walk or just talk the talk? But when they laid Trig in my arms and said that he just kind of melted in my chest. He seemed to say to me, See, Mom, God knows what he's doing. He gave you, some, he gave me to you, and you to me, and this is going to be a wonderful journey. All right, then. I want to help other women who are in the same situation. Women who may be thinking that these are less than ideal circumstances to have a child, and maybe I can just make this go away and we'll pretend it never happened. Yeah, that's exactly what I want to do with this book. Just... Make it go away, pretend it never happened, but no, I'm stuck reading this. Thanks a lot, guys. You're the best. Uh, I want to tell them that you give this life a chance, your life will truly change for the better. Todd and I know Trig will teach us more than we've ever been able to teach him. He gives us an awesome perspective on what really matters. Trig has been the best thing that ever happened to me and the Palin family. Jeez, it's not like she hasn't mentioned this before. I don't want to abuse Tord out too much, though. Bristol, too, didn't expect to be pregnant at 17. But I'm proud that she chose life. She knew it wouldn't be easy, and it hasn't been. She now sees that what seemed like one of life's greatest challenges is now her precious baby. Not an easy road, but the right road. I am, and always have been, apologetically pro-life. What Bristol and I both went through hasn't changed my pro-life view, but it has changed my perspective. I understand much better why a woman might be tempted to take what seems the easy way out and change circumstances. I know what goes on through her mind, even if, for a brief moment, a split second, because I've been there. What my family has experienced in the last two years has reaffirmed and strengthened my support for life at, the very, at every stage. Choosing life may not be the easiest path, but it's always the right path. What if it's a situation where if the mother doesn't have an abortion, she's going to die? I mean, I'm pro-life, but even I know there is a gray area and that there are some circumstances where it should be allowed. But, again, nitpicking. Uh, I need to wrap this session up soon. <laughs> I'm, like, about to crack again. Uh, choosing life may not be the easiest path, but it's always the right path. I had that confirmation. The timing of the circumstances may not be perfect, but God sees a way where we can work. Sees a way when we cannot, and He does not make mistakes. Well, that's debatable, seeing as how He made you, but I, I don't want to turn into a religious debate here. The timing of the circumstances may not be perfect, but God sees a way when we cannot, and He doesn't make mistakes. Bristol and I both put our faith in that belief, and we're learning together what can seem like life's greatest challenge can turn out to be life's greatest blessing. <sighs> and I think on that note, I'm going to stop right there. I'm seriously starting to lose my mind and I'm starting to get a little tired. So, we can actually get a, quite a bit done and hopefully I'll be able to survive now that we're more than halfway through the book. Hopefully being the key word. So, until next time, I will see you guys later.